I'm sorry, I know it's been a while since my last video, but welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at how your bat imparts speed and spin to the ball. Before we begin, let me just explain the structure for today's video. First, we're going to be looking at a model that tries to explain how your bat affects the speed and spin of the ball. While doing this, we won't really be considering, you know, the detailed characteristics of the rubber. We'll more or less be considering the bat to just be a flat object. But even using the simple analysis, we'll later see the things that it explains and then how we can use it. This is going to be a two part video. In the first part today, we are only going to consider the case where the ball has no spin to begin with. In general, table tennis can be a difficult sport to learn and there's a lot of trial and error involved before you know you figure out what works for you. My hope with these videos is that for the people watching, with some idea of the factors involved, you'd be able to figure stuff out on your own faster. With that, let's get started. Consider a stationary ball and let's say you have a force acting on it head on like this. Well, then the center of the ball would be given some speed and it would travel in a straight line like this. Next, consider a force which acts on the ball like this. What do you think would happen in this case? As in the first case, the center of the ball will move at the same speed. But one additional thing that will be happening is that you would have also imparted some spin to the ball. Moving forward, let's just name these forces. If you have a force acting just head on, we'll refer to it as a normal force. So for example, this is, would be a normal force. Even this would be a normal force. Even this. And any force that resembles this, just skimming, we'll refer to it as the tangential force. So this would be tangential. Even this would be tangential and so on. So now, how do we think about a force that is neither normal nor tangential? You know, what if it's something like this? Fortunately, you can break it down in terms of a normal force and a tangential force. Okay, having figured out this, let us see what happens when you actually bring the bat also into the picture. When you also get your bat involved, the force you apply is actually given by the speed of the racket at which you are hitting the ball. For example, this would be an example of a racket hitting with the normal force and this would be an example of the racket hitting with a tangential force. And something like this, you know, you're hitting it with kind of like a mix of the two. Now, let us look at a crucial relationship between the direction of the racket and the angle of the racket and how that affects, you know, how much of normal force you're imparting and how much of tangential force. Let's say the line made by the bat is at 90 degrees to the direction in which it's moving. Well, in that case, you're going to be applying 100% of the normal force. But let's say the angle is zero or like it's, it's along the same line as the force, you know, either this or this, you're just applying tangential force. And if the angle is anywhere between zero and 90 degrees, well, then you're applying a mix of the two. Finally, to summarize, if your angle is at the 90 degrees, you are only going to be imparting speed to this ball. And if it, the angle is somewhere in between, you know, you have two components of the force, one which is only giving speed and one which is giving spin plus speed. If you've been listening closely so far, one thing that should kind of surprise you is, so are you saying that I can't really add spin to the ball without also adding speed to it? Well, that's not necessarily true. Consider the following case where you have two forces acting on the ball. In this case, the speed that they impart to the ball, it cancels out. So the ball will remain stationary, but it will spin. But unfortunately in table tennis, you know, you're just using one point of contact. So there's really no way you can impart spin without also imparting speed. For example, let's just do like a small experiment. Consider this. You might think that, hey, you know, I'm moving the bat in this direction, but why is the nut ball moving over here? Well, if you watch closely, when I'm actually doing this, my angle curves a little bit. If I were to keep it completely straight, the ball would go in this direction. But wait, what if I threw the ball at the bat to begin with? Well, then maybe the speed at which the ball is coming and this force could cancel out the speed, leaving it just rotating. And 
And with this, I think we now have enough tools to take a look at the ghosts of. It's mostly been made popular by Marlin, but let's take a closer look at what you would want for like a perfect go serve. If your aim is just for the ball to bounce on the other side and then return to you, then personally that shouldn't be too difficult. All you need is that there should be enough spin in order to stop the speed of the ball and get it back towards you. There are two ways you can do this. You can either decrease the speed initially that you give to the ball, right? So in that case, you don't really have to add that much spin either to get it to come back. The harder case, or the one that Malin shows in the video, is to impart enough speed that it tricks your opponent into thinking that the ball might just come out of the table. But while also adding enough spin that doesn't actually go out of the table. So yeah, if your aim was to just get the ball to come back to you, I think you could do that easily with like an hour of practice. But if your aim is to get a go serve such that it fools your opponent into thinking that the ball is going to come out, but then you could still do it, but it would take you a lot of practice to really fine tune the point where this happens. Which is why if you see people doing backspin serves, you could see that sometimes they throw it back towards them. What this does is it allows them to add more spin without really having to increase the speed of the ball in the forward direction as much. With our analysis so far, we can also realize that the only thing that you can do with your action is decide the speed, the direction of the speed and the angle of your bat. The angle of the bat, you know, decides what is the ratio of the flat hit contact and the spin contact. And it also decides where you contact the ball. Any other things that you might hear about how this trajectory or some other trajectory might make your stroke better, you should probably take that with a pinch of salt. Also, if you're a beginner or you might have noticed beginners doing this, do not use your wrist to add this kind of motion to the bat. It will just lead to a lot of uncertainty in you contacting the ball and lead to poor stroke formation. There is a way in which you can use the wrist to increase the speed at the point of contact. We we'll look at that in a later video. If you're a beginner, keep your wrist straight. Similarly, other things that you hear about getting power from the ground or using your waist also, all that these things are actually doing is increasing the speed of the bat with which you can contact the ball. And that is helpful. And finally, another thing is you might have heard people say that, you know, if you want to give more spin to the ball, you contact it here because there's more space for the ball to roll. And that if you want to impart less spin to the ball, you contact it over here. Well, that argument does not make much sense because this entire process of the ball rebounding from the surface of the bat, you know, <laughs> it just happens too fast. You're not going to be rolling the ball through the entire rubber anyways, right? So all that, if you really want to decrease the amount of speed you add to the ball, hit it at a slower speed. And if you want to increase the spin, hit it at a higher speed. And with this, we come to the end of today's video. In the next part to this series, we'll be looking at how your rubber imparts this tangential part of the force or the spin part of the force and what the difference between, let's say, a regular rubber versus a long pimpled rubber is. That will help us a little bit to understand serves and how to identify serves. And finally, we'll also try and look at how your bat affects the ball that is already spinning. And that would help us to understand more about how to receive serves and some other strokes. If you've made it until this far, thanks for watching. I can't wait to make the other parts and share the entire journey with you. I'm sorry my uploads haven't been as frequent lately, but if you'd still like to stay connected for more videos like these, do subscribe and let me know what you think about this video in the comments below.